Section 17 of Astounding Stories 12, December 1930, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ape Men of Zlatli, by David R. Sparks. Chapter 4 It was with Naida at his side and the other girls grouped about them that they started their journey to the Kasike, whoever they might be, to have it over with, whatever that might mean. As they strode along in silence, Kirby did what he could to straighten out in his mind the many curious things which had happened since he sat testing his rope in the upper world this morning. In the final analysis it seemed to him that, extraordinary as his experience had been, there was nothing so much out of the way about it, after all. The only unusual thing was the existence of this inhabited pocket in the earth. For the rest, the strange colors to which he could not put a name were simply some manifestation of infrareds and ultraviolets. And then the startling effect of his single shot at the ape-men, that was simply the old story of savage creatures running from a new weapon and a new enemy. Naturally, the shot had sounded loud in this enclosed cavern. Lastly, the pull of gravity down here seemed upset somehow, but why should it not seem so at this distance within the earth? The American was no scientist. The conclusions he reached seemed very reasonable to him. All told, the last thing Kirby found he needed to do was pinch himself to see if he was awake. A place of indefinite extent, the cavern seemed to be exactly what he had already judged it, a giant pocket within the earth. The ceiling, or the sky, was of some kind of natural glass, no doubt the same kind which was crackling on his clothes now, and from it emanated the brilliant, many-colored glow which lighted the cavern. Radium? Perhaps it was that. Perhaps the rays were cast off from some other element even less understood than mysterious radium. As for the plant and animal life with which the cavern teemed, it was amazing. But Kirby did not give himself up to silent observation any longer. "'Will you finish telling me,' he asked of Naida, "'about the task I am to perform for you here?' Naida, walking with lithe strides along a path jungle-hemmed on both sides, smiled at him. "'You are to be our leader.' Yes? Now both Naida and the other girls became sober. You will lead us in a revolt. Ah, Kirby whistled softly. In a revolt against the Cacique, the wise men, whose kind have governed the people of the temple since the beginning. Her statement was received with acclaim by the whole troop, who crowded close around while they smiled at Kirby. You mean I am to lead a revolt, he asked, against these same Cacique, whom we are going now to face. Naida nodded emphatically. Yes, if revolt proves necessary, and it probably will. Hmm. Kirby scratched behind his ear. You'd better tell me what you can about it. Then as they hurried on, Naida spoke rapidly. The situation before the people of the temple was that for a long time now, the only children to be born had been girls. Worse still, not even a girl had been born during a period equal to sixteen upper-world years. The only remaining members of a race which had flourished in this underground land for countless thousands of years consisted of the Cacique, a handful of aged people, and the thirty-four girls, including Naida, who accompanied Kirby now. On one hand was promised extinction through lack of reproduction. On the other, even swifter and more terrible extinction at the hands of the ape-men, whom Naida called the worshippers of Zlatli, the rabbit god, the god of all bestiality and drunkenness. It was the menace of the ape-men, rather than the less appalling one of lack of reproduction, which was making the most trouble now. Ages ago, when the people of the temple had flourished as a race, they had been untroubled by the worshippers of Zlatli. But now the ape-men were by far the stronger, and they desired the girls who had been born as the last generation of an ancient race. The battle of this morning had been only one of many. Dissension between the Cacique, who ruled the people of the temple, and their girl subjects, had arisen on the subject of the best way of dealing with the ape-man menace. Some time ago Naida, heading a council of all the girls, had proposed to the Cacique that support be sought amongst the people of the upper world. This would be done judiciously by bringing to the lower realm a few men who were wise and strong, men who would make good husbands, and who could fight the ape-men. This proposal the priests had promptly quashed. 
They would never receive, they said, any members of the teeming outer races from whom the people of the temple had so long been hidden. Those few who had blundered into the valley of the geyser during the centuries, and who had never escaped, were enough. Better, said the cacique, that a compromise be arranged with the subjects of the rabbit god. Flatly, then, the priests had proposed that some of the girls, the number to be specified later, should be given to the ape-men, and peace won. During the time of reprieve which would thus be afforded, prayers and sacrifices could be offered the lords of the sun and moon, and to Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. In answer to these prayers, the gods would surely send the aged people, who alone were left as prospective parents, a generation of sons. Once the priest's program of giving up some of the girls to the ape-men had been made definite, it had not taken Naida and the others long to decide that they would never submit, and then, while matters were at an acute stage, a tall, blond white man had come to the Valley of the Geyser. Kirby. As Naida had finished her story, Kirby mustered a smile despite the soberness which had come upon him. So the white man came, he repeated after her, and all of you decided forthwith to stage your revolt. Why not? Naida answered. We observed you until we were sure you possessed the qualities of leadership we wanted. After that, we did what we could to coax you to come here. Kirby grinned at that. Now, Naida ended simply, we will go to the cacique. If they accept you and grant our requests to them, there will be peace. If they rage, it will be war. Suddenly, she drew closer to Kirby as they swung along, and slipped her hand into his, looking up at him in silent entreaty. How much farther, he asked in a voice which became sharp, until we reach the headquarters of these cacique. They live in a castle which our ancestors built ages ago on a protected plateau, Naida answered tensely. It is a good distance still, but we will cover it soon enough. They crossed now one edge of a shadow-filled forest, composed principally of immense, pallid, palm-like trees. Farther on the path wound through a belt of swampy land covered by gigantic reeds which rustled above their heads with a glassy sound, and by things which looked like the cattails of the upper world, but were a hundred times larger. Everywhere hovered odd little creatures like birds, but with teeth in their long snouts, and small frond-like growths on each side of their tails, about some swamp plants with very large blooms resembling passion flowers, flitted dragonflies of jeweled hues and enormous size, and under the flowers hopped strange toad-like creatures equipped with two pairs of gauzy wings. Finally, through a tunnel composed of ferns a hundred feet high, they emerged to a still densely overgrown but higher country, which Naida said was a part of the Roro Forest. In the forest Kirby gained a hazy impression of bronzy, immense cycads, and what appeared to be tree chrysophyllums with gorgeous blossoms. Then he received a much clearer impression of other trees with blossoms of bright orange-yellow and very thick petals, each tipped with a glassy sharp point. The disconcerting thing about the tree was that, as they approached, the scaly limbs began to tremble and wave, and suddenly lashed out as though making a human effort to snatch at the bright travellers. Naida and all the others hurried along without offering comment, and Kirby asked no questions. Once he thought he saw a group of gorilla creatures paralleling their course back amongst the forest growth, but if Naida observed the animals she paid no attention. The one thing which had any effect upon the company was the appearance, presently, of two vast bird-like creatures. As these things approached, Naida signaled to all to crouch beneath the shelter of a tall rock beside the path. Enormous, the birds had bat wings, and carried with them, as they approached, the stink of putrid flesh. The long beaks were overfull of sharp teeth. The heads, set upon bodies of glistening white-gray, were black. Reddish-gray eyes searched the jungle as the creatures flapped along, but the pterodactyls, if they were that, passed above Naida's band, without offering attack, and presently Naida gave the command to advance again. In time they came to a chasm-like gorge, across which was suspended a slender long thread of a bridge. Not far above the bridge, a considerable river emptied itself into the gorge in a mirror-like ribbon. Kirby could not hear the torrent fall, or rather could not hear it strike any solid bottom. But from somewhere, 
In the unlighted, unfathomed depths of the abyss rose strange bubbling and whistling sounds. At the bridge Naida paused and pointed to the land across the river, and as Kirby looked in the direction indicated he beheld a rocky eminence rising for several hundred feet straight up from the expanse of a level, tree and grass covered plain. Atop the plateau glimmered the complex towers and turrets, the crenellated walls of a castle, which in its gray antiquity seemed as old as the race of men. "'It is behind those walls that the cacique dwell,' Naida said quickly. "'It is behind the castle, in a series of separate houses, that the older members of the race dwell. We shall go and look upon them presently, but first we will force an interview with the cacique. In silence Kirby took her hand, and with the others following they moved out upon the swaying perilous causeway which hung above the chasm. After that the trip across the plain to the foot of the plateau cliffs was quickly accomplished. Here, however, Kirby thought they must face trouble, for he found that the great walls of a sparkling almost glassy smoothness shot up to a height of at least three hundred feet, and that no path of any sort was visible. "'We're here,' he said. But how can we get up?" But understanding began to dawn as Naida laughed, and produced from the pouch of the side of her gauzy dress four pliable discs of a substance which resembled rubber. "'You are very strong, are you not?' she asked. "'Yes.' "'Then you will have no trouble in following us up the cliff. Our serpent god, Quetzalcoatl, taught us how to climb long ago.' With that she handed Kirby the set of vacuum discs and producing another for herself moistened them in a pool of water close at hand. Then, as all of the girls followed her action, she strapped them to her hands and feet, and in a moment they had begun the ascent. Why, Kirby said presently, with these things you could hang by your feet and walk on a smooth ceiling. Naida laughed, and they worked their way upward. When the climb was accomplished, and the discs were put away, Kirby found himself standing on the outer edge of a medieval paradise, of a magnificent plateau, partly fortified by nature, partly by the hand of man. Ah! he cried in deep admiration, then followed Naida. The building, the castle, in the near distance, resembled a castle of Spain, save that there was greater beauty and subtlety of architecture. Turreted on all four corners, constructed of material which looked like blocks of natural glass, the fairy-like structure was crowned by a gigantic tower of something which resembled obsidian. Up and up this tower soared until its gleaming black tip seemed almost to touch the glassy radiant sky of the cavern. No people showed themselves, and Kirby saw that the bronze-studded portals set in the front of the castle were closed. Admiringly he glanced at the surrounding land laid out in checkerboard patches of gardens and orchards where grew a bewildering variety of unknown fruits and blooms. Butterflies drifted past, and the air was freighted with the scent of flowers. Inside a walled enclosure Kirby saw a good-sized plot heavily grown with the plant on which he had been subsisting. As they passed this ground, each of the girls, Naida leading, made a strange little bowing, gliding genuflection, and Kirby wondered. Now, however, New sights distracted him as they crossed a port drawbridge above a deep moat which was a fairyland of aquatic plants. Although not a sound had come from the castle, the great entrance doors were swinging back. "'Be ready,' Naida whispered, "'for almost anything. The doors are being opened by some of the palace guard. I have little doubt that the word was long ago rushed to the cacique, that we are come to them with an upper-world man.' Kirby answered with a nod. Then they passed the outer doors, passed inside, and Kirby blinked at what he saw. In a long hall decorated bewilderingly with a craven frieze in which appeared all of the symbols common to early Mexican religions, and many new ones, stood a row of bright suits of armor of the sixteenth century. From each suit peered the glassy face and shovel beard of a dead conquistador. So this was what happened to intruders from the upper world. The conquistador who kept his long watch beside the geyser was not the only one. Kirby felt an involuntary chill prickle up his back, but he was not given long to think before Naida, ignoring the gruesome array, clasped his arm. Look! Behold! 
and Kirby saw that with almost magical silence the whole wall at the end of the corridor was sliding back to reveal an enormous amphitheatre, in the centre of which stood a vast circular table. Ranged in a semicircle about that table stood fifteen incredibly ancient men, clad in long glistening grey robes. Blanched beards trailed down the front of the garments until they all but touched the floor. The cacique. Kirby, on the threshold of the amphitheatre, squared his shoulders and held his head high. Then, with Naida on his right, his own eyes boring unyieldingly into the smouldering, narrowed eyes which stared at him, he advanced. But in front of him the priests moved suddenly. From Naida burst a shriek. In the radiant glare of the council room flashed the long, thin, cruel blade of a sacrificial knife. The cacique, who had whipped it from his robe, flew at Kirby with a condor swoop, talon hands outstretched, his wrinkled, bearded face contorted with fury. End of chapter 4